Hi, I'm Luke Sierveld. Welcome to another episode of Meet the Gaffer. Okay, it's time for another guest episode with Ivan Verlan, filmmaker in Toronto, Canada. You may remember him from episode 180. At that point, he was following a high school band that was getting ready for the Rose Bowl Parade. This time, a little heavier subject matter. He's following sort of in a doc style uh, a number of people and they each sort of have their life story vignette. They were shot last summer, not really thinking in terms of BTS. Then uh, he had sort of an intro in December, got busy and finished it off last week. Just to give you an idea of how things came together. If you want to see the final piece, that's in a link below. If you're needing editorial, motion graphics, colorist services, Ivan could be your guy. So give him a ring. All right, Ivan, take it away. Today, I'm gonna to break down the location lighting on an episode of Survivor Stories. This is a documentary series that profiles people who have survived cancer, focusing on the question, what is life beyond diagnosis like? And how did your mental or emotional approach to life change? Survivor Stories is a volunteer project with no funding. Uh, we just wanna help tell these stories and maybe give some hope to somebody going through treatment right now. That means that any costs like crew meals, honorariums, location fees, uh, and even insurance is all paid out of pocket. And it also means that I have to limit myself to the equipment that I either own or can get donated in kind. Before cancer, Paul was really into boxing and kickboxing. And as soon as he was cleared by his doctors, he was back in the ring. So we wanted to focus the visuals for his episode there. While I was open to any type of boxing gym, I really wanted to find one with a ring that was open on at least three sides, and ideally elevated. I found Kingsway Boxing Club online, and it turns out that they organize an annual charity event called Fight to End Cancer, which has already donated more than $1.5 million to cancer research. So yeah, the owner immediately jumped aboard the idea. You can see that this is a very large, open, industrial space. It's quite bright under normal conditions, with a large roll-up door, an 8-foot window, and tons of mirrors. To supplement that natural light, there are about a dozen fluorescent banks with two 8-foot bulbs of various color temperatures scattered around the room. It had the core layout and features that we wanted, but I was after a moodier look for the film. So my main goal was to take the giant bright space and make it fall into the background. Paul needed to be the main focus. When trying to understand somebody's approach on a given film shoot, I think it's really important to know the size of the crew involved. It really does shift the tables if you've got a crew of 50 or a crew of 5. So here's the breakdown of our crew for the day. We have my girlfriend Emma volunteering to do the behind the scenes photos. So she's not going to appear in any of these photographs because she's behind the camera. But in addition to this photography, she also did all the location cleanup, moving of stuff, blacking out of logos, all that sort of stuff. And of course, helping to reset things at the end of the day, as well as general PA duty throughout. Then we have Sam, who is a film student and was our PA. We've got Perry, who is one of those multi-talented guys that can do a little bit of everything, but on this shoot he was predominantly a swing and also jumped in as an AC once in a while. Then we have Joe here trying his best to not be seen behind a 6x2 floppy. He is also a filmmaker in his own right. He's a director and cinematographer for TV, but has worn many, many hats over the years. He's a total pro, total veteran, and he was our gaffer for the day. And we have Julian. He runs our New York studio. He's typically a director cinematographer, but also good at the writing and producing side of things. And on this story, he sort of split all those duties with me. He was the co-director and the co-cinematographer on this. And then of course there's me, I'm again co-directing and co-cinematographer. Now I'd like to take a second and talk about mood. I know that anamorphic hazy films have been pretty trendy for a while now, and slow motion is also pretty played out with seemingly everyone shooting 60 frames per second for the past four to five years. But I will say that there's a time and a place for every technique. If it helps to move the story along or puts your viewer in the right emotional state, then use the right tool. You see, when we set out six years ago to make survivor stories, we wanted the visuals to feel somewhat dreamlike. The content would be everyday life, but made to look ethereal and removed from the everyday to match the reflective nature of the voiceover. We've shot five subjects over the years, each one getting more and more dreamlike as we found the right visual tone for the series. So yeah, it's a bit trendy at the moment, but the aesthetic is firmly grounded in our story. Now, here's how we created the mood. 
Okay, so we had to come up with an approach for lighting the general space and then modifying for each of the scenes as we go through Paul's story arc. So our general approach for the space was to first and foremost knock down the light coming in from that really big window. We decided to knock that down with an 8x8 frame of full stop diffusion. And we did that because I really didn't want to see anything out beyond the window. In real life, if you look through that window, there's a nasty industrial building which you would see through some parked cars and those cars might change throughout the day and there is some chain link fence. Not very pretty. And then I wanted to take that light and wrap it around into the space. So that's where the 1.2 HMI PAR and the digital Sputnik DS6 unit come into play. The light that you see falling on the ring and doing a sort of a three quarter back hard key on our subject, that's motivated by the window light, but it's actually coming from inside the space and higher up for a more pleasing angle. We just used a couple of big rolling junior stands and then used a black solid floppy to cut the light off of the back wall, which was gonna be in a lot of our shots. Finally, the other thing we wanted to do was knock down all the fluorescent light that was bouncing around the space. That's actually one of the things that took us the longest in this setup. A lot of those fixtures were ganged together on the same switches, so we didn't really have granular control from the ground as to what lights we wanted on and off. We just had to go up and down ladders for a couple of hours at the start of the day to, to find the right balance. Obviously, that's going to lower the overall amount of light in the room, but more importantly, it's lowering the amount of light that's hitting the white walls and allowing us to direct the viewer's attention with our much more controlled lighting fixtures. Another really important part of the overall lighting setup here was the amount of haze in the space. I knew that we wanted to use a hazer again to add that sort of dreamlike ethereal feel and really build up that atmosphere so that elements in the background fall off. Now the other effect a hazer has is it lowers the overall amount of contrast in the room and that's really something that was important for us given the giant window in the background. I just wanted to lift up those blacks a little bit and uh, give us a fighting chance of having uh, enough dynamic range in the image. This film was uh, shot out of our Toronto studio and we don't own a very good hazer up here. We have a uh, fairly cheap, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, DJ party hazer. It's it's all right for throwing a bunch of smoke in the room, but it doesn't break it up very well. And we own a Roscoe V hazer down in our New York office, which is a joy to work with. So I had put out a post on Facebook asking if anybody had one that I could borrow or rent for cheap. And a rep from Roscoe actually reached out to me directly and offered to loan me theirs. So this isn't uh, sponsored content or anything, but a big thank you to Roscoe for reaching out and supporting an indie documentary project that had no budget. For the opening washroom scene, we kept it really simple. We put a three foot octobank with full diffusion on a Hive 200C unit and boomed that right out over top of Paul's head. I think it was tuned to around 3500 Kelvin or so. And we used a 1.2 HMI PAR to get that nice blue tone in the background there. All right, so in this warm up scene, we've got our window, our HMI and our DS6 all lighting the general space, and we're using the Hive 200C and the Octobank for some fill, as well as using a 6x2 solid floppy to control some bounce coming off the mirror in front of Paul. So here Paul is talking about the shame of his diagnosis and feeling responsible for getting cancer, and that's sort of his darkest moment, and we have no warm fill going on here at all. We're just using the cool light coming in from the daylight. We're wrapping that around a little bit using the HMI, and uh, of course that window of light itself is diffused using an 8x8 of uh, full stop diffusion. In this sequence, which we were calling the shadow boxing sequence, Paul is talking about um, how he was not feeling human and he was coming to terms with his own mortality. Again, pretty dark stuff. Um, and we didn't want to have any warmth to the shot. So what we have is a hard key light coming off of the HMI and DS6. Then we have a nice edge coming in from one of the fluorescent fixtures that we left on. Uh, and that gives us a nice sickly green tone that really works for, for the content here. And to help give this punching bag a little bit of shape in the background, we're hitting it with a small Felix light set to, I think, 5600 Kelvin. In this section of the narrative, Paul is still wrestling with the idea of being dependent on others uh, and what that means for his masculinity, but he is starting to come to terms a little bit with his new reality. So we do have a little bit more warm fill going on. We're still not full up on the house fluorescence, but we have more of them turned on over the bag, and the rest of the warmth is coming off of that Hive 200C in a 3-foot octa. Alright, here's where the story starts to turn. 
Paul is focused on recovery now that he can acknowledge that getting cancer wasn't actually his fault. This is where we're starting to get a lot more warm tones on our foreground. So in terms of lighting, what we're doing here, keying from the back corner, the uh, DS6 and 1.2 HMI, we do have some practicals overhead, the fluorescence. We are getting some green tones coming in from the practical fluorescence that we left on, but it's not doing a whole lot in the space. Most of the work is being done by the HMI and the DS6. The warm key light that we're seeing in the ring is coming from five or six Felix P360 uh, lights that we rigged to the ceiling. Now we took the lights, mounted them up to the ceiling, and then tented some diffusion over them to unify them into one sort of broad, soft, big, warm source. And we took this approach predominantly so that we wouldn't have stands in the shots and we could move quickly and reposition the camera wherever we wanted. And we also didn't have budget to rent any big light mats or sky panels. And I mean, sky panels would be fairly heavy to be rigging up there as well. So yeah, we just used what I had at the studio, which happens to be a bunch of these Felix lights. Aside from having to run some additional cabling right at the start, they're small, they're lightweight, and uh, pretty easy to rig around whatever is built into the space. And now at the end here, he's beaten his battle, uh, he's beat cancer, and we're all feeling warm, happy, but exhausted. So uh, what we've got is a, a warmed up key light. That warmth is created mostly in post, but we do have the Felix lights warming things up on the fill side, and we were able to warm up the DS6 a little bit because it is an LED RGB fixture. And in terms of camera, I know this is a gaffer's channel, but a bunch of the viewers commented on my last video that it is helpful to understand what the camera system is that we're using. We shot Paul's episode on a red Scarlet W. The lens used is a bit of a weird one. It's a Leica Similux 50mm 1.4 as the base lens, and then sitting in front of that is a Cinelux 2X anamorphic adapter. For those of you that are familiar with anamorphics, you're going to say, wait a second, that, that, that doesn't look like a Cinelux. No, it is a custom-built housing that has a single focus solution built into it. Don't ask me for many details about it. It's something that was custom made for another cinematographer and then I wound up purchasing it a while ago off of him and uh, don't have any contact with the person who made it. Sitting in behind the red we have a Teradek Bolt 500 that's built specifically for these red DSMC2 bodies. That's sending a wireless video signal over to our monitor and then in behind that we have a Core SWX uh, shark fin plate which just allows us to mount two V-Lock batteries at a time and hot swap them which means we don't have to power down and start back up the red every single time we're doing a battery swap. And last but not least, we have a Teradect wireless follow focus system. And in this setup, we only need one of the motors. All right, hopefully you picked up a few tips there on how to light one big space and then modify to create different scenes within it. I'd like to thank Luke for hosting me here on his channel again. That's all for this week and we'll see you again next time. It's just got that nice, soft thing from above. And I don't know how you're going to be able to do that without, I mean, with the gear you have. Like, you know, you could potentially do something like that by having just the muzz up and then pounding light into the muzz. But even so, it's not going to be nearly as, as even as space lights coming through it from above. Okay.